Thank you. All right, so so we'll have the first lecture from Professor Vegan from ETF Security. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for being here. I was just asked whether we actually enjoy doing these lectures. And I very much do. It's usually very low-key, very relaxed. You get to talk on a just a very casual level. So I really enjoy being here. So. Um, yeah, I put a few words to myself. Sam Morrison from Switzerland. He's actually not Switzerland here, but I'm going to come to that. And uh, originally, I'm actually a physical chemist, so I started off as an NMR spectroscopist. So I did a lot of spectroscopy in the past. And I was working on, NM I don't know whether you know nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, it's with nuclear spins. And those people usually work with 10 to the 18, 10 to the 20, even more spins. And I was always curious what happens if you go down, try to make uh, smaller spin ensembles, and eventually arriving at one spin. And this is how I entered the field of quantum sensing. So roughly 10 years ago, then we started doing experiments on single spins, and then we actually realized that spins are very good sensors for magnetic field. And, and this is what we have been doing in the last 5 to 10 years, trying to exploit spins uh, sensors for magnetic field. Um, OK, just about this slide. So last week, I was at the similar workshop or school in Les Uches, near Chamonix. So this is a Mont Blanc here, which is the highest mountain of at least uh, Central Europe. Uh, this is one nice day. Uh, next day it rained into the snow. And I was really looking forward to this year, which is the spring or summer time. Although I heard it has been as cold as it hasn't been in a long time. But uh, again, yeah, I also enjoyed this, so it's great to be here. Um, Good, so I prepared three lectures. So one is today, one is tomorrow, and one is on Friday. And uh, so the first one is going to be extremely basic. So I just call it, what I mean, I'm probably understanding now to be what is quantum sensing. And I'm heavily biased, I'm a spin physics person, so I will be thinking of qubits and spins, but I'm trying to make it general. I'm going to ask some very basic questions about what is quantum sensing. Um, then the second one is quantum sensing with NV centers in diamond. So this is one of our main topics. The other one is force sensing, which doesn't involve quantum, but it's also very sensitive measurement. So I enjoyed this morning hearing about force sensing. We understand something completely different on the force sensing, but uh, I think there is also common ground. Um, NV centers in diamond are solid state spins, in, so spin units. And then the third one is actually part of the second one. It's an application of NV centers. Uh, one goal in our lab is bringing fundamental physics to applied physics to applications. So sometimes I say I'm applied physics. So how can we exploit these NV centers to actually do something? And one goal we have is trying to build a nanoscale or single molecule MRI imager. So we'll take a molecule and be able to image, localize all the atomic positions. So I'm going to show you what we do there is actually a prime example of how we use all the quantum techniques to get some information from the model. Okay, so these are the three topics. Um, I usually tend to speak faster and faster as time goes. If I'm getting too fast, I'm just with your hands and slow me down. Um, we just see how far we get. Okay, so let me start with quantum sensing. So, a question to you, what is quantum sensing? Who knows what quantum sensing is? Please raise your hands. No one? Okay. <laughs> I see I'm not, you're not from Europe. Uh, in Europe, we have this big quantum manifesto, which turned into so-called quantum flagship, which is funded by one billion dollar in one in 10 years. Um, rumors go it's funded by Europe by one million because the Chinese put aside 10 million, 10 million, and we have to somehow so order of magnitude. But if you look into this, uh, there are four pillars. And one is communication, computation, simulation, and the last one here is quantum sensing or quantum metrology. So at least if in Europe you should know what it is because this will buy on average 250 million euros fund your position. And I guess we're down here in this corner, education and quantum sensing. Um, Good, so you should know what it is. So then if you go on, what do you do if you 
don't know what quantum sensing is. I usually go to Google and type in quantum sensing, and if you type this into Google, there's actually no entry on quantum sensing. There are two entries, quorum sensing, which is something from biology, and quantum sensor. So let's look at quantum sensor. Redirect it from quantum sensing. A uh, quantum sensor is a device that exploits quantum correlations such as quantum entanglement to achieve a sensitivity or resolution that is better than can be achieved using only classical systems. Uh, this goes on for a little bit, but there is also an extra note. This article provides insufficient context. Please help improve this article. Uh, October 2009. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, I'm just going to go back with this uh, at the end of the lecture. But let's continue. This means simply there is no real definition or consensus on what quantum sensing is. So this is actually great because we can now come and make a definition. Um, and this is what we try to do. And this was, I'm just going to present you now with three definitions that have worked for us over time that are floating. So they are up to discussion. So what is quantum sensing? Uh, three definitions. The first one. Um, quantum sensing is using a quantum object, qubit, uh, to measure a physical quantum, be it classical, be it quantum. Um, or more generally, a quantum object, something with discrete energy levels. Um, second definition, we use quantum coherence or wave properties, superposition states, some properties of quantum to, make, to measure a physical and I guess many of you probably could identify with this. We've seen a lot of wave-like superposition, uh, coherent properties. And I very much like those two definitions because they're very basic and they're also very close to applications. If you think of quantum sensors, and I'm going to get to a few examples, it's very often they exploit something from here. And as an applied physicist, those are actually great definitions. Uh, there is a third one, which is I would say a bit more narrow-minded, more theor theoretical, but some people are really saying this is really quantum sensing. So using quantum entanglement to improve the sensitivity or precision of a measurement beyond what you can do classically. So I would say this is mostly our Wikipedia entry. And some people say only this here is quantum sensing because I mean you can build this actually from classical waves or mechanical resonance. You can emulate those without really using anything quantum. Um, so here, quantum entanglement, this will be really quantum. Um, in order to do this number three, we're going to look at qubits. You need at least two qubits, otherwise you can't really do an entanglement. Um, so I'm mostly going to stay with those two. I'm going to hint a little bit at the third one, and I guess we're going to hear a lot in this workshop about the definition three. But for me, being a practical person, it's uh, useful to stay with one or two. And we're mostly going to stay with qubits. If you have a qubit, you can also very well, mostly also do definition two. You can do superpositions or coherent manipulation. So if you want to boil this down, number one definition is a qubit. Second one is coherent superposition, and the third one is a thing. Okay. Um, so now let's get to a few examples. Do we already have quantum sensors? <coughs> so what would you say now is a quantum sensor? Who has a favorite quantum sensor? I guess most of the experimentalists will have a favorite. <laughs> so probably most of you that do experimental, yeah. I like the Faraday rotation and squeezing. Faraday rotation and squeezing? Great. Any more experimentalists? Someone with superconducting qubits? Yeah. Okay. So uh, you can almost turn any of the tools that you use actually in quantum sensor, at least find a definition you partially that. So I picked just a few for historical reasons. Uh, the first one is simply an interferometer. You do superposition of two, two beams. And you can use this, for example, to measure distances like in the gravitational wave we've heard also for um, yeah, measuring other things like whether there's another type of wavelength uh, change if you change one of the, the beam paths. So this will be in that sense uh, a 
quantum center. Another one which is heavily used in the past is a squid magnetometer, measure very small magnetic fields. And so you have a, a current, it goes through two, through two loops with these junctions here, and then you measure the phase, the, the flux, that is the, the product of field and times the, the area, and this gives you a magnetic field measurement. Those are the, among the most sensitive magnetic field measurement devices. And actually they're also kind of because you get an interference between the two uh, currents here, the phases. And we see already the barometers are phenomenal tools at measuring small quantities, being small magnetic field or small displacement. Um, I'm putting here a third. I hope I, hope, uh, I, got, I got the right picture here. Uh, I'm not working with atomic clocks, but those are, you could also qualify as, as uh, quantum sensors. They can exploit quantum coherence. In this picture here, you actually have a, a beam of atoms that are in state A or B, so you could say it's a qubit. Uh, then you make sure they're all in the same state. You make them interact with a microwave field, and if the interaction is on resonance, you can actually change the state. And then you have a detector, so you sort out the right uh, atoms in your detector that tell you whether you have flipped the state. And because this is very uh, much dependent on the frequency, you can actually lock the internal frequency of the atoms to the external microwave frequency. Um, so again, you exploit quantum properties, two-level systems, and in this case, a resonance, to make them many. Okay, so these are three examples. Now getting to the more example that we heard. Uh, I'm going to take the standpoint that the qubit is a very useful quantum sensor, and you can build on this or many schemes of quantum sensing. Um, okay, so I put together a collection of qubits. I hope you find yourself there. Um, spins, solid state spins, uh, trapped ions. You can do this in atomic vapors with many spins. Again, with the ions here, you can be single or many. Uh, there are MR sensors in MRI imagers that try to locally measure the magnetic field for susceptibility. Rhythmic atoms are very sensitive to electric fields. Quids, superconducting qubits. So there's a whole range of qubits or qubit like systems. Um, we're later on going to classify them. I mean, what distinguishes one from the other. But for now, I'm just going to take the standpoint and look at the world. Uh, how can we do quantum sensing or quantum measurements with a qubit? So let's start at the beginning and let's just have a look. What can we do with a qubit? How can it interact with the environment, and how can we actually then get some useful quantities by just having a qubit? So let's start with a qubit, and we're going to define it as something with discrete energy levels. Or even taking a more basic step, let's assume it has two levels. If it has more levels, usually one can reduce it to two levels or to a, uh, an interaction between the two levels. So let's start with a two level system. Has two states, zero and one. This one is higher energy, that one is lower energy. And usually you can be prepared in either the lower or the upper state. So now this qubit is characterized by two states, and then our system is <coughs> in one of the two states, or sometimes in a certain position. And uh, this is characterized by an energy level difference. So by exciting the system, with precisely the right energy or precisely the right frequency, I'm mostly going to use H equal 1. We can change it from 0 to 1. And if you look at this basic picture, two levels, and you're able to change the state by using the absorption of a photon, we can actually already infer two things on our environment. So what can we learn by doing this absorption? The first one, if we do this on purpose, we can apply some light, some photons, and if our photons have the correct energy, they're going to get absorbed. So we actually can use our system to measure what the energy of our photons is. So one of the key pieces of information is we can find out what the transition energy or the transition frequency is. So if you want to measure it, we measured what the transition energy of our qubit is. 
uh, because this transition energy very often changes in the application of these, this is actually going to be one modality to measure. And so we're just going to look at shifts of the energy, and this is through the absorption of a resonant photon. There's actually a second piece of information which we now want to go uh, two ways. So let's just say we don't apply any field, we don't probe what this energy different is. We just prepare our system in the ground state here and wait for some time. So eventually our system may absorb a photon and spontaneously go to the upper state because there is some radiation around. So the second thing we can actually learn is the presence of resonant photons. So we have a probe that can measure if there are many photons this absorption will be faster. If there are a few photons, the absorption will be slower. So we have a measure of how many photons are in the environment of our qubits, but it's not any photons. It's only the photons with the correct energy. So we actually have a probe of the spectral density of photons at this particular energy. So this means we can do a second type of experiment. We can probe dynamics, high-frequency photons of a very specific energy, so how many are there, um, but just looking how long does it take for this uh, qubit to go from one state to the other spontaneously. Spontaneous. Okay, so these are the two key modalities that we have. We can either look at changes in the energy levels, or we can look at how fast uh, the system absorbs the photon. Okay. Um, so what else do we need? We've seen we started out with zero here, and we went to one. Uh, sometimes we apply this field to uh, get a photon, and then we need an ability to find out, I mean, we need an ability to put it in a defined state and then find out whether it went from zero to one. So, second thing first, so we need an ability to first prepare a qubit and then, some time later, after we perform our experiment, to read out whether we stay in zero or whether we move up to one. So this is very similar to uh, quantum information, quantum computing. We need to be able to initialize our sensor, and we need to read out what the final state is. OK, and we need one more thing. Just if you want to probe what the energy level difference is, we need to be able to somehow manipulate the qubit to send out in a field that probes the transition frequency here. So we need some sort of external control in order to be able to manipulate the key. Um, just to give an example here, we can probe this difference here by just shining in photons and tune the frequency and see when absorption happens. Um, if you want to be more sophisticated, we can also do superposition states. So we can apply a short pulse of light that uh, on a glass field puts us into the equator, or just creates a superposition, and then the superposition will evolve. Um, and I just want to show you that it's actually the same type of two key pieces of information if you make the superposition. So if you have a superposition state here, let's assume the lower state requires no phase, while the upper state requires a phase phi, and this phase phi uh, depends on voltage, then the frequency difference and the time. So we see that we, by looking at this phase here, we can already again probe what is our frequency if we have a fixed time. Or this can also be inverted with atomic clocks. We have a very well-defined frequency so we can probe the time. Um, so we can find out what this frequency is, which is key quantity number one. Um, how do we find out about the second key quantity? What happens if we have a spontaneous change from 0 to 1? We get, a, get an exchange of the labels here. Or uh, we can also have uh, a random phase being picked up. So we can look at some random changes, some random phasing, some relaxation to find out the presence of photons. So in this, in this phase here, or in, in exchange of 0 to 1, we can actually detect the presence of stochastic fields. So with a superposition measurement, we can get the same key piece of information that we can with a, just a very basic absorption measurement we see before. OK, so what can we measure with qubit? Um, anything that covers the qubit. Anything which changes the energy 
level difference or which creates a random field. So let's stay with the first one. Anything which changes the levels of the qubits changes the transition frequency, and this is what we can measure. So we can put this in a very simple formula. And in most cases, there is a linear change, like a linear Stark effect or a, a Zeeman shift of magnetic field. So let's say we have a field change delta V. V is just electric field, magnetic field, maybe something different. Uh, so this is creating a change in frequency delta V. So we have a field which changes the frequency. And there's going to be some proportionality parameters. If we have a unit change in field, how much frequency do we shift? And we usually take this to be a, a factor of a uh, symbol of gamma. So we call this a transduction parameter or coupling parameter with magnetic fields and spins. It's a gyro magnetic ratio. So it's hertz per unit of field here. So if this gamma factor is high, we can have a qubit which is very sensitive. If the gamma factor is low, it's not very sensitive. It just tells us how much is the frequency change for unit change of the um, So now you can just look for what can change this field value here. Uh, we've seen this, for example, in the first lecture this morning. We have a gravitational field. We can look for changes in the gravitational field. So we can apply an external field, very macroscopic, which is then measured by our device. So we can apply external fields and just look at a bulk magnetometer, for example, or electrometer. If I change the external field, how much do we change the qubit? Um, we can also do this locally. Usually, quantum systems can be made very small. I mean, maybe centers in diamond or atomics in size, also many trap ions. So, this is not the only field that's going to be around. Especially here in the solid state, there's lots of local fields by ne nearby uh, fluctuators that also create. So we have an environment, and most people that work with humans are very well aware of this. This is what causes our incoherence. So we have an environment, we could model this by a lot of other <coughs> systems that randomly change, and this random change in the environment may lead to fluctuations of our line here, so the energy levels may change slowly or fast in time. Or if these changes are fast enough, they may emit photons which are now absorbed here. So this is all captured with this change of field here, but the origin is much more close. And you've seen I point the arrows, and this is what's going to be the difference here. If you have an external field here, it will influence the qubit. Our qubit will not influence the external field, or very, very, very little. Um, let's say we measure the weight of an atom. So we have a gravitational effect of the Earth on the atom, but the effect of the atom on the Earth is extremely small. Same with the environment, if you have a lot of qubits in the environment, it's almost unidirectional. So our environment is going to influence your outer qubit, but the qubit has a minimal effect. If you go down to fewer and fewer qubits, we can actually couple our qubit to another qubit. And still, our qubit can do measurements on this other qubit. Just let's say this is one spin, another spin, you can measure whether the other spin is up or down. But now we have a one-to-one -one relationship, and now we have to be more careful because now this qubit if it changes its state, it's going to have a direct, in both ways, direction uh, effect. So uh, the the, what we ever we do a measurement on our qubit will affect the other qubit. So we can go hierarchical and ask ourselves, well, I mean, will our measurement change what we're trying to measure? In this case, not. In this case, yes. OK, so let's just very briefly summarize what key things did we learn or can we do with the same qubit. So a qubit can give access to two, two key pieces of information. One is the transition energy, and the other one is the transition rate. And this just reflects the coupling of the qubit to a DC static or sometimes dynamic field. Um, what do we need to do this? We need a way to initialize the qubit in the zero, for example, to read it out. Is it zero or one at the end of our measurement? And we may need control fields. Sometimes not, mostly yes. Um, what can we measure with the qubit? And anything that couples to the qubit, external fields, the local environment, or discrete other qubits. Good, so this is just a basic umbrella of what can we do with the qubit. Um, so 
So in the next step, we'd like to get more specific how we actually carry out an experiment. And there's tons of qubits, there's tons of different techniques, so the experiment will always be kind of different. But it's still it's possible to boil this down to a kind of universal scheme, which not always, but in most cases, works out as a general paradigm for how you do the measurements. And if you do a specific one, very often you can relate that to this basic scheme. So I'm going to show you a basic scheme and then a few specific, more specific examples, also historical examples. So the basic protocol is, well, let's look at our group qubit. We initialize our qubit, let's say zero, we wait for some time, and then we inspect whether it's still in zero or one. So step one in our basic protocol is that we prepare the qubit. So we need a way to initialize it, <coughs> hopefully with high fidelity in zero. Okay, next step is we expose the qubits to the field that we're trying to measure. So we let it evolve under a Hamiltonian, which describes the coupling from our qubit to the field that we try to measure for a time. Um, it will acquire a phase or it will undergo a transition. And in the end, our qubit has, our, has a state alpha. So we don't know whether it's 0, 1, or even a superposition. So the third one is then we try to observe the probability. Do we end up, do we stay in 0, or did we transition to 1? Usually we call it transition probability. What is the probability that during this time t, the qubit makes a transition from 0 to 1? Um, in order this, to measure this probability, we cannot do one single experiment. In most of these experiments, we have a projected readout. So if you do one cycle, we initialize, we then evolve, and then we read out. The readout answer is going to be 0, or it's going to be 1. So this doesn't give us much information. Um, in order to derive in how many cases, what is the chance that we went out there? We have to repeat the experiment many, many times. And we can start building up a histogram. And from the histogram, we get a probability that tells us in 60 out of 100 cases, we were in 1, and in 40, we were in 0. So this is the key feature here. We have to repeat the experiment. Even if you have a perfect detector, we have to repeat it because of this quantum projection. Um, and then the last thing is that once we measure this probability, we have somehow to relate this to the field. So if we get a change in probability, how much of a change in field in units of Tesla or volts per meter um, or gravitational constant that does this change correspond to? So we have to do some parameter estimation. We may have to make a series of experiments and then do some mathematics to infer from P or a series of different P measurements what is the key information, the field change that went into the OK, so this is the very generic scheme. Uh, and now let's look at some also historical examples of how this is actually performed in the lab. And it turns out this is uh, a very old story. So let's look at an example first for the transition energy and then also for this um, spontaneous emission or absorption. So how do we measure transition energy in back in history? And uh, we just do spectroscopy. Like people have been doing it for over 100 years. So how what do you do in spectroscopy? You have your system, you shine light on it, and you look at what wavelength is uh, the light absorbed. So if we cast this in our formalism, what do we do? We, have, we change the wavelength of the light and we measure the absorption. So the absorption is actually directly our probability. Um, so the readout here is done by looking at how much light is absorbed. What is the initialization? So this is, can be different, different cases. In this case here, it's mostly just thermally. The system relaxes if we do not put on a lot of light, it will always decay in the ground state and we'll just get some non-equilibrium population. So this very basic spectroscopy experiment already has most of the elements that we've seen. We initialize by just working at uh, thermal initialization into the, into the ground state 
we excite using this external field and we excite at a series of frequencies which can be in this picture here. And then we inherently also do the averaging, not in time by a series of experiments, but just by having an ensemble. So in some sense, the spectroscopy method here is all at once. So we do all, four, all three steps that we had here at once, and then how do we infer the information that we like from P? So well, what we measure here is this absorption curve, and in order to find out what our frequencies that we like, we simply do a fit and find the peak value. So the fourth step is, in this case, a mathematical fit. We find the central value of this is the output of our experiment. So we have a quantum system, and the output here is a central frequency. OK, if we change our transition energy, line shifts, and then we can ask ourselves, for example, how small is the smallest shift in the OK, uh, another example, I'll call it Ramsey's method. So we're going to hear more about Ramsey interferometry, I think, in the afternoon. I was hoping we could prepare the ground. I guess in this case, it's now the other way around. Um, so this is, can give you the, exactly the same information, but in a time domain fashion. So how does it work in this case? Let's prepare the cumulative state zero, apply a pi half rotation on the blast here, so put it in the superposition state, still at time zero, let the system evolve for a time t, and it will acquire a phase here, so time times that frequency. And then we apply another pi half pulse to project it back into that uh, in our readout basis, which is 0 or 1. And then we have a probability which oscillates in a sinusoidal fashion as a function of time and frequency. And then we do again a readout, like uh, with the absorption measurement. So in this case, the information is not in frequency space, but it's in recording, repeating this experiment for a number of different time delays, t, and plotting out this oscillation. So if you plot this out, then you get an oscillation, and the oscillation frequency, uh, the period of this oscillation is directly the inverse of the frequency you're trying to measure. So we get the same type of information. We record this curve, and then we make a fit or a Fourier transform, and you get the frequency. So the output is again the frequency. If you change the energy level splitting, this oscillation period will change. You have an oscillation which is now faster or slower, in this case faster, and we get a new frequency. And you also see that initially the lines are almost on top of each other, and here they're running apart. So this experiment will become more and more sensitive the longer we can make this time here because the longer the time gets, the better we can discriminate to various frequencies which are very close. Question? Oh, yeah. What do you do in time pulse before the projection? Okay, so partially, so why do we do a pi half pulse before uh -huh. projection? Um, so the specific answer is I'm a spin person, uh, and we send the person and there we read out, the initialization is always in 0 or 1, and the readout is in 0 or 1. The more general answer is, depending on the system you have, in what basis can you do a measurement. In this case, we do an initialization in the 0 and 1 basis, so we in one of the two states. And our readout basis, what can we detect, is also 0 or 1. We're able to tell is in the lower or the upper level. And our measurement actually is not performed in that, in that basis. So we first transform from our initialization basis into the, what we call the measurement basis. So we start out with the coherence proposition let's say the loss we along x, and then we would like to know at some later time is it still along x or along y, but we can't measure that. So we have to turn the system or uh, transform it back into a basis that we are able to measure. Um, nuclear magnetic resonance, as you have in clinical uh, MRI images, actually measures directly in the xy basis. So there you would start and directly detect this, but in many cases you can. So we have to go back to the basis that we have. That we are able to measure. Oh, okay. So we have I have multiple spin. I will like apply the pi pulse. We wait for the spin and then apply the pi pulse. Uh, so it's a pi half pulse here. You go from Z in the block sphere to yeah. the X. So there is no spin echo yet. <coughs> oh, okay. Um, so
So spin echo and things like this. So during this time t, you can do additional manipulation of the qubit, which may be a spin echo. Uh, this is a one of the arguments that you can actually engineer in Hamiltonian during this time. But uh, this is probably. Okay, so then one example how to measure trans the transition rate. Um, so how we measure this transition rate? We analyze the realization or the decoherence of the qubit. So let's say we prepare it in zero or in one, and then we look at how long does it take if we have an emission, and I'm excluding here uh, spontaneous emission, I assume the stimulated emission. Um, or we look at decoherence, we prepare a superposition state, and look how long it takes until there's a random phase accumulated. Um, so with our relaxation and decoherence cost by, for most of you working with quantum systems, we say it's the environment, Find fluctuates, and the fluctuation is what causes the phasing or even a, an energy relaxation. Um, so the environment is stochastic, and this is what you pick up here. There's another answer which is older, which is I call Albert Einstein's answer: is stimulated absorption or emission. And the two are actually very equivalent. So in Einstein's picture, we had a system, two levels, and he calculated a rate by how fast you go from one state, from one state one to zero, from zero to one, still excluding any spontaneous emission. And the formula you put down is that we have a rate in uh, inverse seconds, which is proportional to a density of states of the electromagnetic field times some coefficient, and this coefficient here is atom dependent. So, rate of transition. The spectral density of, let's say, electric field, that also be magnetic field for spins, at exactly the right energy and an atom dependent coefficient. And we can relate those actually directly to what we had in the beginning. Um, so we have a rate here, then the uh, spectral density here corresponds to stochastic emission or absorption of photons from the environment, and then the B21 is just our coupling, similar to our gamma that we've seen before, how much couple, how much does the qubit couple to a certain type of field. So the two pictures are actually very equivalent. Um, so you see these formulas which are actually very useful. So you see it's a spectral density, there is a frequency here, and this frequency is the transition energy, and then there's this coefficient. We can extend this to also include decoherence. Um, in decoherence, we have a random phase change here. And this phase change does not require any energy or almost no energy. So what we probe in decoherence is actually the same formula. The only thing that changed is that we now know that the frequency of our uh, qubit transition varies at frequency zero. So decoherence is actually a probe of the spectral density not at frequency nu, but at frequency zero. And usually, the spectral density has a one over f-like behavior. Usually, there's more noise at low frequencies than at high frequencies, which in this case motivates why the coherence is usually much faster, or the phasing is much faster than um, energy relaxation. OK, so how do we measure the transition rate? Um, in the techniques that we call relaxometry, and it's very simple. We prepare our qubit in state zero. We just do nothing, wait for a time t, and inspect whether we're still in zero or in one. And in many cases, this can be described by the uh, probability, the transition probability that is exponential. Um, so this probability holds if our absorption is relatively slow, such that one can, uh, can apply further <coughs> order perturbation theory. So the absorption does happen quite rarely. And we don't have to take into account higher order perturbation theory. And this then comes out in a first order rate equation uh, according to Fermi's golden rule. So the, absor the absorption here is it's a relatively new interaction. And uh, if you plot this curve here as a function of different time values, then you get something like this. If you prepare it in zero, and then our qubit will just decay to some equilibrium value. In this case, it's an equilibrium value, which is 
roughly 50-50. This is for spin qubits, which have a very low energy barrier. So just thermally, you're almost with equal probability B1 or 0. Um, if you have an atom at, light, at a high, much higher frequency, which tries to relax to a ground state, then it will stay start at 1 and it will decay close to 0. Um, but the key thing is here is how fast is the decay, what is the exponential decay constant. Um, so now, this is if we have a certain amount of fluctuations which allow the qubit to relax. If you increase these fluctuations, if you have more noise at the, the spectral frequency, then the decay will be faster, we just get a, a new curve, and we can fit this curve to get a faster decay rate. So these are like, these are, uh, the relation here is quantitative. If you go back to our initial formula, we can measure the rate, we can know what the coupling coefficient is, so we can actually, in uh, real units, find out what the spectral density is. Um, so I have here one example, and I'm not going to go through the details. Actually, let me go through the details. Let's say, assume we have a spin qubit, two levels, up or down, we have a certain energy gap, Transition energy is given by um, this gamma factor here times the magnetic field, and then it depends whether you spin up or down. Um, you can calculate what the spin transition rate is. Spin transition rate is then a spectral density, so it has units squared, it has our coupling coefficient squared. It's a spectral density of magnetic field at the transition frequency times some coefficient, and this coefficient simply tells us which fields, is it a field along x, y, or z, which components do couple to our spin. Field here is vectorial and not all vectorial components couple the same way. Um, so this is a factor of order of unity. So we have the spectral density of magnetic field and we have a transition matrix element. But this one, we can measure in units of inverse seconds coefficient here is known, so from the transition rate we get a quantitative value of what is spectral density. Um, but only at a very specific frequency. In many cases, like for spins, we can apply magnetic field and we can actually change this energy level splitting. So if we systematically change this energy level splitting, we can actually map out what the spectral density is of the environment. So we actually can perform spectroscopy of the electromagnetic field over a certain uh, energy level. So this is a very powerful method, which is uh, maybe not visible at first sight. First you think you can just measure transition energies to map out spectroscopically what that uh, dynamics is in the uh, environment of the cube. Okay, so next intermediate summary. So what toolbox do we have for measurements? We can use spectroscopy, I would we'll call this CW method. So there's no time involved in this case. Um, we just do a spectroscopy measure, we measure transition energy, and we're sensitive to static or slowly fluctuating fields. In the front is kind of the pro version of spectroscopy, CW spectroscopy. We measure coherent oscillation, we can get the same parameters. We're sensitive to static fields. There's actually tricks with spin echoes to also measure AC fields that are faster than the fields you make in the measure there. Um, Qualitatively different method is reduxometry. We measure the noise spectral density, um, and we're able by changing the energy gap or looking at different types of relaxation to map out the frequency spectrum of radiation. Okay. Good. So I have, I think, two more um, sections. Let's see how far we get with time. No. Okay. So I'll start with the first one and we see the second one. So the first one is now what is the sensitivity? And it turns out if you go from the formalism, you can arrive with a pretty simple formula that captures the main ingredients to what is the sensitivity of a qubit if it were common sensitivity square. Okay, so for this I'm gonna go back to this Ramsey measurement where we measure an oscillation. And I'm just going to look at what is the signal, what is the noise. This gives us a signal-to-noise ratio. And then we can look at how the signal-to-noise ratio changes if we change some of the key parameters. So here we have again the 
ground speed frequency, ground speed oscillation. For blue is one certain frequency or one field type at one field. And the dash line is for a slightly different field. And what we now can do is we can go to some specific time t and look at how does our probability, which is what we measure, change if we have a slight change in um, the field causing this change in p. And so let's say we go to time t. And the strategically very useful point is to sit at the point of maximum slope where we get the maximum change in p for the minimum change in field. OK, it looks like time, minimum change in field. Um, you could also sit at the bottom or at the top here, and then you get a, a different type of measurement, but, uh, which is now five, uh, ten in a second. Good, so what is the change in? What is the signal from noise ratio? Again, it's a change that we get in P, we call it delta P, and then signal to noise, we have to find out some noise. So this is the precision that we can measure. Or what's the smallest change in T that we can measure? Okay, so let's start with the signal here, delta P. Uh, change in P caused by signal on certain measuring P. So the signal delta P. So let's assume we have a small change in our field. This is going to create a small change. So change in field times gamma gives us a change in frequency for phase time t. Gives us a change in phase. So we have a small phase change, which then causes a change in the transition probability. So the change in the transition probability is given by one half the sine of delta v. Uh, assuming we are at the strategically best point. Um, this is then t times delta nu is equal to t times gamma times delta v. And then if you're just staying in this linear range here, so we assume the signal is quite small, that we don't exceed our dynamic range, then we can make the approximation, um, the small angle approximation, and uh, put it in this final form that the signal delta p is one half time coupling factor times our field. So this is our signal. Um, now let's go to the noise. Uh, actually, one extra point I wanted to make. We can sit at the strategically best point and we think let's always go here. And this is the best point for this type of measurement. There are actually measurements where your field may be slowly changing, so you don't know whether your field is slightly positive or slightly negative. So there are cases where you don't know the sign of delta B. And then you start averaging and if you don't know the sign, you will average change that goes up or down, and you will average to zero. So there's a second strategic point, which is not shown here, it's sitting here or at the top. In this case, you're insensitive to the sign of the signal. Whether it's positive or negative, you're just going to go down the slope. And this is another mode which is very often used and very useful if you don't know the sign of, the, of your signal, which then scales quadratically with your field change and also with time. Um, but for now, we're just going to stay in this linear regime, not a quadratic one, where you sit at top of the Good, so the signal is given by this expression here, let's look at the noise. So the ideal noise is how precisely can we measure this. If you do one measurement, we've seen one measurement, the outcome gives us zero or one. So the uncertainty, if you just do one repetition, is enormous. You just get 0 or 1, you don't get any information. <coughs> you have to repeat the experiment. And if you repeat the experiment, then we get some statistics. We get a number of readouts with 1, a number of readouts with 0, and we get a binomial distribution. If you look at what is the standard deviation of the binomial distribution, it's 1 over 4n square root, and n is the number of measurements. So the noise, the ideal noise, limited by projection noise, which we in this case we can't eliminate. So the fundamental limit is given by the standard deviation of the binomial distribution. Okay, so this is the ideal noise. Um, let me just actually picture this really quick in the, in the picture. So we perform n measurements. You get, you get n0 times the answer blue and, and 1 times the answer 1. And we just look at the imbalance of if you now have a real system, we're going to measure a quantity like photons, and we're going to have a, a broadening of this distribution. So meaning, we measure 
certain level, but now we have measurement noise, which uh, disrupts our experiment. But you can still, in most cases, tell we had either a, a zero readout or a, a one readout. Um, if you have a lousy readout, then the two histograms will completely merge, and we're not able to tell in the readout whether it was zero or one. You can just build up an overall um, histogram, get a medium value here, which then directly reflects our P. Here will be P0, 1, and we just look at the center value. So the message here is, in a real experiment, we not only have to worry about projection noise, but also on the noise that we add during a readout. And we can simply capture this by an extra factor. Um, so we have our real noise sigma p, which is larger than our ideal noise, and we can look at how many quanta of noise in relation we add. Um, people who mostly don't use a factor that tells you how many quanta you add, but they take the inverse of it. So 1 over c here will be the number of quanta of noise that we add. We use the c parameter, which is equal to 1 if you have an ideal readout. If you have a real readout, you add, add extra noise. The c factor gets smaller, and it goes towards 0. So if you would add 10 quanta of noise, the c will be 0. So our noise here is getting larger as our readout is getting worse. So now we have an expression for signal, an expression for noise, and we can put them together. The SNR is delta P over sigma P is one half T gamma delta V, and then divided by the noise factor here. And if you multiply it out, we get that our SNR is T gamma signal we're trying to measure here readout efficiency, and the number of repetitions. So how do we maximize the SNR? We make T as long as possible, so our interaction time. I think this was the same T as the two seconds we've seen in the first half this morning. Um, we have a coupling constant, so our Q we should couple as strongly as possible to the field. We want a sensitive Q wave. That is maximum change in frequency, or even change in signal. And delta V is our signal. We want an efficient readout method. It just has to be efficient. It doesn't have to be super high fidelity or super efficient. We just have to get to the threshold of single shot readout. And then we want to repeat the experiment as many times as possible, maybe measure times long, but this is not very attractive. So usually we want to have a unit SNR in a certain time. Good, so what should we do? I think this is the best shot here. Let's take T as long as we can get. So the next question is, can we make this infinite or not? Of course not. If you have a Ramsey fringe, our Ramsey oscillation will eventually decay. So it's limited, in this case, by the coherence. So our maximum T is limited by how long uh, our system coherence evolves. So the maximum T cannot be made larger than a certain number. So let's elaborate this on one more slide, which then gives us our final SNR formula. Um, so we have to multiply SNR by a factor that accounts for the coherence, and if we have an exponential decay, which very often uh, you have, then we have to have a, an exponential factor that penalizes if we make our evolution time too long. So our SNR for small times, it increases linearly with time until we have hit this limit, t equals t2, and then very rapidly exponentially drops off. And from this, you can see what the optimum value for T is. It's roughly T equals the T2 decoherence time, or the phase time. Um, for this particular example, it's actually T2 half, but let's assume it's on the order of T2. So it's maximized for making the time up to the decoherence time of any number. So then our formula looks like this. So we just replace T by T2. And drop this factor here, so there's an additional small fudge factor here, which I neglected, which comes from this e to the minus t over t2. So this is now our, our maximum SNR, make t as long as you need to be this time. Uh, we can simplify this further and normalize it to time. So each repetition takes some time, and if you have a good sensor, then initialization is fast, readout is fast, and you spend most of your time in this middle period, where actually your qubit interacts with the field. So ideally, this n is given by t, which is equal to t2. 
So assuming that n is equal to total time spent on the experiment divided by t2, the formula again gets slightly simple. When we get our take home formula, so to say the maximum SNR is given by our coupling, of course, our signal change, relight efficiency, which can be maximum of one, and then a square root of total measurement times and t2. So if we normalize to a unit measurement time, one second, then the only hands we have is take a good qubit, long t2, that couples strongly to the environment. Very often this is contradictory. If we couple this qubit couples strongly, it means usually usually t2 is also slow. So we find, have to find one which maximizes this impact. And then we need a qubit which just gives us good access. Okay, um, I guess I'm running out of time. Okay, so I'm going to skip uh, this chapter, which should come to our third definition. Why, when can we use entanglement? Why are n qubits n times better than 1? And I'm going to go on to the summary. So let me just briefly summarize. Um, first point. We can use a qubit as a quantum sensor to measure changes in the Hamilton. Where these co changes come from is not really important. External fields, local environments, just other qubits. Um, then the basic scene that we use is that we initialize. We let it evolve and we read it out. So it's kind of like a classical sensor. You have to reset it, measure something, and then check what you measure. What we really measure is a transition probability. <coughs> built by repetitions of an experiment if you have this projected readout. The toolboxes that we've seen is spectroscopy, CW, chromatography, reductometry, the um, And the sensitivity we have seen is given by how long we make, can make the time t2. Projection noise, if we don't have a good qubit, there may be additional errors which I didn't get into, and by the coupling of our qubit to the um, Okay, so leading on to that will be tomorrow. Um, one thing we can look at is which qubit is the best and how can we compare them. And we can start grouping these qubits, I'm going to show this again, so don't worry, into for each qubit, what does a qubit react to? Where does it have a high gamma? Trap ions, very sensitive to electric fields. Which energy range can we probe? Where is nu? Megahertz to terahertz. Um, what readout or initialization options I have? I will read out here, which is really the more difficult. In this case, it would be optical. So we can start classifying qubits according to their uh, practical applicability and performance. <coughs> if you want to know more, there's actually a, a review that we just recently put out in the review of modern physics. Um, very often we present lectures based on the review. In this case, it was actually the opposite. Um, so we prepared this lecture before, and we combined our materials, both by Friedman and Reinhardt and Ola Papillaro, to put them in this review, which is based on the lecture that we part of have seen here. Um, it's a very long review. It's about 40 pages. There is one table I like a lot. There's a table which summarizes this. It's uh, on one of the first pages. So if you go into that paper, there's a table one which looks at all different qubits and it classifies them to what you measure, what the frequency is, how you initialize them, what the readout is, and even which definition of a quantum sensor uh, they mostly pertain to. Good. So to end, this is a school, so I guess there is allowed to be homework assignments. So you see this is a Wikipedia article. So this is your chance to make an impact, be the first to put down a uh, concise uh, summary of what quantum sensing is, catching up on this 2009 entry from October 2009. So, uh, thanks for your attention, and I guess in the next lectures we can see uh, more specifically with screen qubits. Yeah, so 
I guess you're, you're talking about read up errors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, yeah, you can go to different types of. So ideally, you have, don't add any noise. You can always tell it was zero or one. Now add a little bit of noise. Then you can say, I've been into zero or one, but sometimes I make the wrong assignments. And this is going to give some extra error, which will. The other error, which was uh, the root end fluctuation, came from the fact that you have a limited number of trials. Yeah. So it seems to me that the readout error and the root end error are independent, so why are they not adding a quadrant to it? Okay, very good point. I got this asked before, so maybe I should change it. So you have two independent errors. You have one, which is the projection error, one over root, one over four n, and a readout error, which is, let's say, sharp, sharp noise of optical photons, and you just add them up. Um, it makes a lot of sense when analyzing the errors, you want to know which one is bigger than the other. So we can ask ourselves first, which is the more one is the more fundamental? It's the projection error. So we can express the other error in units of our projection error. And this is where this comes in. You can say, how many extra equivalent quanta of projection error do I add because of the readout? Okay. And so the C factor takes care of this. But it's even more confusing, it would be the one over C factor. If you add, let's say, 10 quanta of projection noise, the C factor would be 0 0.1. Okay. Um, I mainly put it here because it has been the most widespread use of how to take care of the error in the, in the field. Okay. But it's not very intuitive. You add two errors and then well, the express you express the one by the other. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so no more questions. Let's thank all the lecturers again.